Of but course. But it still needs a joke under. That, I mean, that's yeah. the problem with so People many, have so many of these degrees. young guys. They think it's all attitude and all. No, yeah, no, but you got to work it, on it's it. It's got to have jokes. The typical structure of a joke consists of a setup and punchline. So, what does the setup do? The setup builds up the audience's expectations. However, this is done. The most common superstition in the world today is a belief in horoscopes. It has to engage the audience's emotions or attitudes. Usually this expectation leads to some sort of tension, anxiety, or nervous energy, and this is followed by a relief through the punchline. And there's a name for people that believe in horoscopes. They're called single women. <laughs> Another way of thinking about this is in terms of a puzzle. There's some puzzle that needs to be solved and we feel a relief from solving it. Sometimes the relief is derived from realizing that the puzzle is absurd and not meant to be solved at all. If I had a daughter and she was in the next room going, Mommy, there's a monster under my bed, I'd be like, Yeah, of course there is. That's where they live. The comic can use an overblown exaggeration, almost a Socratic irony, to build up tension in the audience by eliciting some emotion or attitude. This can be spite, disgust, reproach, anger. And under-exaggeration can have the same playful effect. But the elicited emotion is often more neutral or positive. Something like pity, adoration, or confusion. I hated how Oprah was interviewing him and acting like she was dumbfounded that this guy would do this. Like, she's been in show business for 35 years and she can't, like, wrap her head around <laughs> some guy doing whatever it takes to get to the next level. Here, Bill Burr is eliciting an emotional response from the audience by criticizing Oprah. The reaction from the audience is built because Oprah isn't the usual target for criticism. So there's some confusion or shock. There's a puzzle. Didn't she for the first five years have like midgets who wanted to bang their mailman's boyfriend? <laughs> and, she, and she didn't want to do it. She didn't want to do it, but she didn't have the power to say no. So she wrote it out. And then when she could make a good decision, she did a show. The built up tension engages the audience on an emotional level. It's a very subtle manipulation. When the exaggeration becomes obvious, the tension starts to be relieved. The audience knows he's not seriously criticizing Oprah. It's all tongue in cheek. The audience knows now. They're in on the game. They've solved the puzzle. But she stood on the heads of those little people for five years until she got. And then she, she's sitting there across from this guy, like, like, so how could you? You know exactly what he's doing. The use of specific concrete examples reinforces the connection between the comedian and the audience. The particular feeling or experience that resonates between the comedian and the audience is integral for there to be a tension, a genuine tension, that the comedian wants to have on the audience in the following relief. This underlying point of building a connection between the comedian and the audience can be put another way. Be relatable. Still, it must be original, or else it can't build a genuine tension. The familiar is boring, it doesn't elicit the appropriate response on the audience. Every box of Swanson says hungry man on the box. I imagine they had a marketing meeting. They went, all right, we're not going to do anything about the quality. We're agreed upon that. So which segment of the public should we target that could potentially even choke this pig food down? What about hungry men that are broke, alone, and starving? Taste is the least of their problems. <laughs> Here, Seinfeld employs a common ground between him and the audience, the TV dinner, and attacks it from many different angles. But it's an honest product. It's TV dinner. T they're telling you, TV dinner. Stare at the screen and chew. <laughs> Do not look down. <laughs> Eyes front. Grind it out! Here, the relief of observational humor is finding novel insights in something so ordinary, like TV dinners. I do think Swanson has helped people. It helps people reach their personal life goals, in a way. I've had, I had a lot, millions of them when I, when I was starting now. When you, you peel back that, that plastic cover, you plow through those four compartments of hell. By the time you get to that peach cobbler, you go, I gotta make something out of my life. The use of bodily gestures and facial expressions adds a dimension of realism for the audience, makes this seem believable, and this is crucial for building up tension. If it's not believable, if the audience is aware that they're being manipulative, there can't be a genuine tension and relief. The comedian must be in control. 
In this respect, tone and volume are also important. It captures the audience and makes the scene more authentic. Because it's, it's 6 a.m., I'm just, ugh, I'm so deep in the, in the deep African sleep. Like, it's just an ancient, mysterious, submerged in a river of warm chocolate, just... Note Louis' mannerisms, gestures, and expressions. Not only are they important for communication, they also paint a picture for the audience. And sleep was like a goddess whore just sucking me off, just... Uh, she's got a gold helmet and 40 tongues, and she's... Again, tone and volume elicit an emotional response, and it goes to further reinforce the comic's persona. Uh, and she's speaking in a dead language. Uh, and she's feeding syrupy heroin into my penis while she's sucking. Uh, let this be my life, please. Let this be real. Let this be real. Daddy, no. Uh, shit. The use of rhythm or pace is another important feature. Comedians use a slower pace to build up a certain tension and switch to faster pace to capture the audience's attention or provide further relief. I'm one of those people that's so smart that I'm uncomfortable in this world. <laughs> and I'm scared to live. I'm not scared to live, but it's scary out here, god damn. I know how flimsy this shit is. I can see through this, I can see the truth. There's an animal inside each and every one of you. It's not good. Note here, Dave's use of pauses for emphasis and tension. Shit is real. Listen, I was looking at the paper the other day. I'm not making this up. There's a serial rapist in Houston. There's nothing funny about serial rape, but... <laughs> the pacing, the rhythm, the pauses, they're all important techniques for public speakers. There's an animal inside each and every one of you. It's not good. Shit is real. Listen, I was looking at the paper the other day. I'm not making this up. There's a serial rapist in Houston. There's nothing funny about serial rape, but... <laughs> what is noteworthy about this particular rapist <laughs> is that all of his victims have been men. Enjoy your evening. Life is like a Lasers, aeroplanes, it's a duck blur. Might solve a mystery.